Hi, I'm Chris Cooper. Welcome to the family plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Thanks for joining us. Home canning is a great way to preserve the food you grow in your garden. But what's the best way to get started? What equipment do you need? Today, we're gonna to give you a head start on canning. We'll also be talking about conifers. What are they? Why should we plant them? And what are the best conifers for our area? All of that and more is just ahead on the family plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, so stay with us. This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for the family plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Kathy Faust. Kathy is the director of the UT Extension Service right here in Shelby County. And Carol Reese is here. Carol is a horticulture specialist with UT Extension. Thanks for joining me. Glad to be here. All right, Great now let's talk here. canning. Okay. You know, it seems to be real popular now. It's making a resurgence. You know, everywhere you go now, people want to know about canning. So yes. we're talking about canning green beans. Why do we need to can? green beans? Well, green beans are a low acid vegetable okay. and to prevent the growth of microorganisms okay. or botulism, we have got to pressure can green beans. Okay. Yes. Now let's take us through the process. Okay. If you can imagine, we're in my kitchen okay. and we've got these three pots on elements on the range. If you have a ceramic cooktop, you cannot do this. Okay. It's, it's got to be either a gas range or an electric range, yeah. not ceramic. Why? Okay. Um, wow. The pressure canner gets too hot okay. and it will crack the ceramic. Okay. Yes, so you've got to go with your conventional. The first thing we need to do is check out our equipment. All right, let's do and that. And okay. we, we test these lids at our office, okay. if anybody wants to bring one in. And I've actually seen a couple of people bring those oh, into yeah. the office, Ms. Kathy. Yeah. Here we there go. We go. All right. If you have a dial gauge, you can bring it into our office and we'll test it. Um, usually, they test out okay, but if it's more than two pounds off, we okay. suggest that you get a new dial gauge. Okay. And we also check the gasket because many times people will call and they'll say, I've had this on the stove for 40 <laughs> minutes and it isn't building up pressure. Okay. The reason could be the gasket is old or dry rotted or they could be losing steam through the dial gauge, uh, you know, some malfunction. Also, before you can, you want to run a string through this little vent okay. to make sure no food has clogged. To do our green beans, we're going to pressure can them for 20 minutes for 20 pints minutes. Okay. at 11 pounds of pressure and 25 minutes for quarts. Okay. So we'll just set that aside. All right. And we've got about two to three inches of water in the pressure canner. That pressure accuracy is to make sure it gets to the right temperature? Yes, okay. and like I tell folks, this is not something you can do and multitask. Okay. You can't yeah. check emails, you can't look <laughs> at Facebook. This is something, that's why I've got my timer. Okay. You have got so you to have to keep stand, your eyes on oh, it. Oh, okay. yes, you've got to stand here with it. All right. And you begin with some fresh green beans. I bought these at the farmer's market. Good. And you go ahead and snap your green beans. Uh, you also have a huge pot. I like to use a stock pot. Okay. And let's say that this has boiling water in the stock pot. And we've got our, you can usually put about eight cans in here. And you just lift them out of the boiling water and put them down on your tray. Do they need to be totally submerged? Yes, they do. Okay. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Okay. I want you to have in your mind all of this preparation that you have to have because you've got to have your jars hot, you've got to have two to three inches of water simmering in the pressure canner, and, and this is something important that many people don't think about, you've got to have your lids simmering at 180 degrees. And see, I've got wow. a thermometer in here. Right. Uh, many times when the lids don't seal, this is why. Okay. Because if you put it in boiling water, 
uh, that little rubber gasket just boils away. So I tell people to have this uh, set aside and 180 degrees. Wow, it sounds like it's a lot to do at one time. It is. It? Oh my gosh. That's why you can't multitask. Oh. Okay. Now, how do we go about preparing the green beans? Oh, this was easy. Okay. I just went ahead and got, uh, I have about eight ounces of green beans okay. in here, fresh, and I just went ahead and um, trimmed the ends and the strings, pulled the strings off, and put them in a Ziploc bag. Now, there are two ways you can do this. You can either uh, hot pack where you put them in a big pot and bring them to a boil, okay. or you can put them in boiling water for just a couple of minutes because the longer they cook, the softer they will be. Okay. In, in a way, that's good because you can put more in your jar, but before you serve them to your family, you are going to be boiling these for 20 minutes. These I canned in 2011. Oh, wow. Okay. They're still good. I had okay. some a couple of weeks ago. But before you serve them, you want to boil for 20 minutes to make sure there's no botulism or bacteria. And also, these jars have sealed. These were from 2011. These were from 2012. And we recommend consuming the vegetables within two years. Okay, yeah, I was about to ask you that. Okay. Yes. Okay. So when you tasted it, it was still fresh? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. It tasted still like tastes fresh, just right out of the garden, green beans, which is why this is so popular. Okay. You know, gardening is popular, and yes, people it is. say, oh, I've got all these green beans, and we tell them to pressure can. When I was at the zoo last week, we had folks coming by saying, oh, oh, our grandparents did this, <laughs> but they didn't use a pressure canner, they used a water bath canner, which they're really taking a chance because the acidity of the soil has decreased. Okay. And you've got to use the pressure canner. Okay. They, they've been very fortunate. Well, let me ask you about this. What about the altitude? Because, you know, I hear that question a lot when it comes down to canning. Yes. Uh, Memphis is 300 degrees, ab um, 300 feet mm -hmm. above sea level. So that's why we use 11 pounds of pressure okay. for 20 minutes. If we were up in Colorado or someplace yeah, like that, we elevations. might have to use 12 or even 15 pounds of pressure if we were at a very high altitude. So the higher the altitude, the higher the pressure. Okay, that makes sense. Now, now what do we do next? Okay. okay, let's say that we've got our hot jars and we take the hot jar out of the water and you go ahead and drain it. All right. People ask, well, do I have to sterilize the jars? Not in this case, mm -hmm. because we're going to process for more than 10 minutes, otherwise you would. A lot of times people just go ahead and put the jars in the dishwasher. I like to do that, that's a shortcut. <laughs> So you go ahead and let's say too that these green beans are hot. I'm, I've gone ahead and I'm spooning the green beans into the jar. And this jar just came out of that hot water. Yes, let's, I'm glad you mentioned that. Okay. If, I want you to think that that hot jar came out of the hot water. Okay. We want to leave about one inch of head space. Okay. And, and let's say that this water is boiling. So we're going to pour the water into the jar leaving one inch of headspace. Okay. How do I know I've got one inch of headspace? This helps us check, oh, and that's wow. about one that's inch neat. of headspace. Mm -hmm. This is a kit that you can purchase at Walmart. You have the funnel, the uh, bubbler. Why do we call it the bubbler? You, this is important also. You need to stick this down in the jar and make sure you get rid of all of your air mm. bubbles mm. Okay. because that might interfere in the pressure buildup. Ooh, now you see, I can put a few more beans in here, just a few. I think you've done this before, Ms. Kathy. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, we've done this a lot. <laughs> so everything's hot and sterile, does it matter if the spoon and the strainer aren't? Well, uh, you want to wash everything in hot, soapy water okay. before sure. you begin. Everything needs to be clean. And for pints, we're going to add about one half teaspoon. Okay. Of and that's canning salt. Okay, it's canning salt. Okay. So let's mix this up. And that's okay. different than. It's different from table salt. This has a finer grain okay. and it's non iodized. Okay. If you want to take a look at it, you can see how fine grain yeah. is. Oh, like a yeah. powder. Mm -hmm. And that's your canning salt. Right. And a pound of this will last forever. It just lasts forever. So I've gone ahead, I've done the bubbling, I've gotten the air bubbles out. I put the salt in. Now we're going to wipe our lid because if you have just a tiny piece of green beans on your lid, that might interfere. And you see how they're already floating to the top? Mm -hmm. You know what would prevent that? 
if these green beans were piping hot. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. now, that would okay. make a difference. Now, we come back with our lids. lid. Okay. And we're going to put that on top. Again, and that little piece of green bean would keep it from sealing. It would. Okay. And we're going to wipe our lid. Put the screw band on just fingertip tight, not too terribly tight. <laughs> and then we're going to come over here. And remember, this is in water that's simmering at about 180 degrees. Okay. And how much water? About in two inches. Okay. So we've got hot jar, hot beans. Now we're going to put this in our canner. All right. Okay. And you Just put it put close to the side, Ms. Kathy? Uh, matter, I like or? to allow about one inch all around. And you can okay. put about eight pints in here. There is a rack in the bottom of the canner. You don't want to put your beans directly on the bottom of the pot. Uh, you need your rack, so you go ahead and arrange these. And then, this, this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Ah. You line up the V on the lid, and you've got the V on the handle. Line these two up. Let's see. Get a good yeah, seal. Let me bring it a little bit closer. Yeah, this is the tricky part. Looks like it's there it is. Yeah, yeah. uh -huh. okay. This is the hard part. And locked. you've got this on the stove. It is locked. Okay. Now what we're going to do is turn it up. If it's an electric range, turn it on about number seven and you watch as the heat begins rising and steam will begin escaping from your vent. Okay. If you've got something I like to have like a, um, a dark tray that I can hold up behind it and when you see a steady steam spray what you do is uh, you let that vent for 10 minutes. After the steam has vented for 10 minutes you put this petcock on. Okay. Now at that point the steam will begin rising and your dial gauge will eventually come up to 11 pounds. When it comes up to 11 pounds, wow. you want to set your timer for 20 minutes and just sit there with it. Just sit there with it. Man, you like, really have to have your instructions right no kidding. there. You got oh, it. Oh, oh yes. my goodness. Yes. And when it comes up to 11 pounds and you start timing for 20 minutes, after it has reached mm. 20 minutes, you go ahead and this is, you need somebody big and strong, who can <laughs> help you lift this canner off the heating element. Okay. And you let it cool down. It takes probably 30 minutes. Wow. And you don't take this off. You will let no. that. Just leave it oh, on if there. you okay. were to take that off, ooh, big trouble. Okay. But just go ahead and let it cool down naturally for about 30 minutes. After it has cooled down, you wait an additional 10 minutes. Then wow. you can take this off. Okay. All right, Ms. Kathy. Well. I know this is a long process. But yes, okay. <laughs> but we do appreciate you doing that for us. And like I said before, I may mean, definitely have your instructions right there in front of you. Oh, but yes. you can get at the office? Oh, yeah. yes. Uh -huh. Just call us and we can tell you all the steps. Okay. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. All right, Ms. Kathy, thank you again for that canning demonstration. We appreciate that. Thank you. All right, Ms. Carol, let's talk conifers. Okay. So before we even get started, what is a conifer? It's a cone-bearing plant. Okay. So conifer just, you know, we rearranged the pronunciation a little bit. But <laughs> <clears throat> if we said conifer, maybe it would yeah, be, <laughs> <conifer. Yeah. laughs> be more easily understood. Uh, and often we think of them as evergreen. They aren't always, of course. Our common bald cypress that we find in our swamps would be an yeah. example of one that is deciduous. And sometimes the cones don't look like cones. Like on the junipers, yeah. they look like little tiny blue yeah. berries, but if you dissect them, you know, anatomically, they actually are a cone. Okay. Conifers. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, and I know something else, you know, 
basically here in the South, when we hear conifers, we're like, wait a minute, those can't grow here. Yeah. It's too hot. Right. Is that true? Well, it depends on the conifer okay. because, of course, we do think of them as more of a northern. Yeah. If you look at the natural range of our native trees, um, you'll find spruce and fir yeah. and hemlock in the cooler regions. And you don't in the south, but you do find cedar and juniper. Mm -hmm. and, and if you go into the southwest, you'll find the true evergreen cypress, which, okay. of course, our our cypress isn't really a cypress. It's a taxodium. We won't get too, okay. <laughs> too technical <Yeah>. there. <clears throat> but um, there are, of course, a lot that we'll do here. But we grew up with just such a small range. You know, we always yeah. had the little ground cover junipers mm -hmm. and maybe an arborvita or two. And that was kind of what we thought uh -huh. of conifers, period. Now, why do, why do we need to plant them, though? Well, the range is so exciting. And now that we've gotten more well-versed in what will mm -hmm. grow here in the south, um, and I think, you know, the, the first, when you first start gardening, you think flowers. Yes. And then you start thinking, well, maybe other seasons <laughs> should be addressed and maybe other things that can be interesting. And conifers present such a great range for design. Okay. Because I don't know what it is about them, but they, they tend to mutate and you'll find weeping mm. forms and See, columnar yeah. forms and forms with gold foliage or yeah. blue foliage. So you've got all these exciting things to do in design. Okay. Wow. Because I think one of the things people fail to do when they think about design is to think about using the growth habit of the plant okay. as interest. Because um, I, I thought this was a great thing I'd read one time. It said, if you photograph your garden in black and white, it still should be interesting. <laughs> That makes sense. It does. Yeah, it makes sense. So if you've got a tall, narrow form against a spiky form against a roundy, moundy form, you've got a great composition going there before you even look at color. Wow. I never thought of that before. Yeah, black and white. Makes sense. Okay. Now, which ones are good for our area? Because I know the people out there want to know. Right. Okay. Uh, most of the junipers, we do well with, with most junipers, which are um, very tolerant of our heat. Some of the western species of juniper aren't real tolerant of our humidity. Humidity, but, okay. But when we talk about our eastern red cedar, of course, that is truly yeah. a juniper, as you know. Yeah. Uh, and there are a lot of other species of juniper. So, in general, we can find uh, ground cover forms okay. or spiky shrub forms. And a good example is right out at the um, Ag Center on Walnut Grove Road, the big gray owl junipers in the mm. parking lot. People have probably seen and seen mm -hmm. that those are wonderful plants. Then we have the um, false cypress. The false right. cypress are really good for the south. And oh, you can find a great range. You can find perfectly round natural meatballs. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. I know, I hate meatballs. I was about to say, don't you hate meatballs? I hate meatballs when <laughs> people shear their right. shrubs into unnatural meatballs, but a natural meatball is <laughs> But this is natural, fun. okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> You'll find perfect pyramids and okay. again, spiky forms, very feathery, ferny forms. Okay and a lot of different colors in the foliage as well. And then the cryptomerias. Yes. Uh, cryptomeria is fun to say. A lot of people want to yeah. call them Japanese cedars, yeah. and that's confusing to me because then we start talking about true cedars. So cryptomeria is fun to say, and I always say, yeah. I just remember Crypt. tales from the crypt. Yeah. And you can remember it. <laughs> that's a good way to remember it. That's right. And, uh, of course, the cypress, we know about those. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people just think about the ones in the swamp, which are big trees. Yeah. But they're weeping forms of our common bald cypress. And we have a great collection of conifers, of course, over at the Experiment Station in Jackson. We are a recognized um, American Conifer Society right. reference garden, and we specialize in the ones for the south. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, let's talk about this. So we want to get some of these conifers that you're talking mm -hmm. about. How do we prepare the site? What's well, most important? Drainage, generally, okay. and sun, not for all, but for most. Um, one of the exceptions for sun is the little, um, the little Japanese yew. It's okay. not a true yew, but that cephalotaxis, and it'll make a spreading, beautiful, mm -hmm. evergreen shrub in shade. But for most of the okay. conifers, we want sun, or mostly sun, okay. and excellent sharp drainage. And there's a couple of exceptions, and uh, one of the thuyas, in fact, I forgot to mention the thuyas or the arborvitas okay. are also very good evergreens for the south, and a couple of those will take wetter sites. Okay. But if you don't have good drainage, I always recommend planting up on a mound, right. you know, raising mm -hmm. that bed, maybe mixing in a little bit of gravel or mm -hmm. sand, but to make sure okay. that those water, that water does move away from the roots. Okay. Gravel. Yeah, we yeah. actually okay. sometimes mix pea gravel into some of our planting sites. Uh, the station on our ground is so flat. Okay. okay. Just to raise it up a little bit, sometimes we'll do that. Okay. <laughs> now, which ones do we need to avoid? 
because we don't want anybody running out there getting something right. that's not for this area. Yeah, so. and it's funny, we'll, we'll get argumentative, <laughs> plant people will, because they will have a spruce yes. that has lived. Uh -huh. And I'm like, yes, but for every one that was planted, for every 10 that were planted, maybe one succeeded. Yeah, yeah somebody always has just that one. The yeah, exception you're right. to the rule. Uh -huh. So we generally avoid spruce and fir. Okay. We could experiment a little bit with hemlock because hemlock actually comes all the way down in the top of North Alabama where okay. the Appalachian tricks out, trickles out until the dead gum woolly adelgid yes. came on the scene. Yes. And that's an insect that is just mm -hmm. killing hemlocks. Yeah, knocking them out. Yeah, right. right. So we can't, uh, well, we could if we wanted to treat it constantly, which we could do, but mostly we just don't want people to, to plant it. It's sad because there's such a great range of them as well. Um, and uh, larch is another one okay. that does beautifully nice. up north and doesn't necessarily do well here in the south. You just kind of have to go enjoy those up north. Um, and another thing I meant to mention, with, with the larger forms, you can use them as screening plants. Okay. And I always think it's kind of funny sometimes when I'll see people make a screen of some, like a Sunday supplement poplar. Okay. They order those fast-growing deciduous <laughs> yeah. poplars that are deciduous. So yeah. in the winter, all the leaves fall out of the good right. screen. <laughs> and also, people will plant loblolly pine as a screen. And you'll see this around old home places out in the country all the time where it's all trunk oh, yeah. and a little top knot of needles at the top. So they don't necessarily make good uh, screens. So a diverse mix is always a better idea. A diverse mix. All right, good information. You ready for the Q&A session? I am. All right, Miss Kathy, jump in there with us if, okay. you, if you like. Okay. <laughs> okay. Here's our first uh, viewer question and some photos from Mark, all the way from Appleton, Wisconsin. Really? Yes. We're excited about wow. that. I have a grass taking over my lawn, especially in the lower areas that may hold more water. It is bluish green with small leaf blades instead of single grass blades. It is also very viney and overgrows the existing grass. I've been told that it is a bent grass and there's no way to kill it without killing the surrounding grass and receding. We have it on the screen there. First question, what is the best way to kill this grass? Second question is how do I keep it out of my yard? I currently use a riding lawnmower and mulch the grass. This is what it is. It is creeping bent grass. Perennial I cool season grass. Mm. We don't have it in this area because of our temperatures. Okay. okay? Loves cool nighttime temperatures, all right? But here's the thing about it. It grows by creeping stolons, real shallow root system, okay? So if you cut your grass at the highest possible height, mm. you can crowd it out. Good idea. Okay? Yeah. Or you can just remove it with a shovel, sharpshooter, you know, trial or something manually. like that. Yeah, just manually. Mm -hmm. If you must use a chemical, you can use a non-selective herbicide. Glyphosate is a non-selective spot treatment. Okay, because you don't want to kill your surrounding grass. Wait till it dies out, reseed, side it. Okay. And you'll be fine. And, and if it were a cool season, it would be growing in the cool season. And if they had, a, do they use warm season turf grasses up north? Most of the grasses they have in the Wisconsin area is going to be Kentucky bluegrass. Okay. So. Right, which is a cool season grass. So they don't have a time they could spray when the other one's dormant. Gotcha. Okay. They can spray, but it'll be real slow, right. you know, acting. But yeah, if you cut it to possible that's, highest height. That sounds like the best yeah, solution. Yeah, just let it crowd it out. And like I said, if you must, then use a non-selective herbicide. Knock it out, go ahead and reseed it or sod that area, let it grow in, it'll be fine, okay? okay? And this last comment is, question is, is there anyone else that you would recommend to review this issue? Yes, there is, Mr. <laughs> Mark. That would be your local extension agent in your county. All right, but we definitely appreciate the question. So we're yeah. excited about getting that one. Okay, I'm gonna have to be real quick with this one. Okay. My crepe myrtle leaves are covered with, with some type of black stuff. Why is it doing that? And I actually pinched this off this morning from a crepe myrtle. Did you? Would you uh -huh. like to tell them what that is? It's sooty mold. <laughs> this is, I love this because it's such an easy one yeah, to answer because we see so much of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's actually, you know, people think it's sort of a fungus or something, but it's actually, it, it is a fungus growing on the, what would, called honeydew. honeydew, caused by insects feeding on the twigs and leaves and they drip that goes through their body mm -hmm. onto the leaves. The <laughs> sticky film then promotes this sooty mold, right. this little fungus. So you can actually rub it off and it doesn't usually kill the plant, uh, but it does probably slow down the photosynthesis right, sure. because you're getting covered sure. up. So you have to kill the insects. You do. And if you actually uh, look at the back of the leaves, Ms. Carol, you can actually see some of the aphids oh, on yeah, there. Look you at sure it. Can. I uh -huh. mean, it's, it's covered right. with aphids. Mm -hmm. Which is easily done with uh, the, 
I like the systemic products that you can put okay. around the base, the amatoclopril, right. which would one treatment would take right. care of it throughout the whole system. Right, that's the merit. Yes. Okay, that you uh -huh. can get. Right. Okay. Or uh, Bayer's Advanced. Yeah, Bayer Advanced Tree and Shrub. Right. Right. Uh -huh. Insecticide will work. <laughs> A uh, heavy stream of water. Can, can wash it off mm -hmm. even. I mean, if you actually put a little bit of a soapy solution on there and give it a little time, you can spray it off with a hard stream of water. But okay. these leaves are done for the summer. I wouldn't <laughs> bother. And, uh, but yeah. the same thing I say. I mean, this is the fall. The leaves right. are going to fall off anyway. But you want to make sure that you get those leaves up. You want to practice good sanitation. Good right? point, yes. Okay. And then you want to prevent it next year. Yes. Start early. Put, put whatever product okay. you're going to use to prevent the insects. Because once you've got it on there, it's, it's there unless you try to wash every leaf with them. So oh, we're not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. No. All right, thank you. Okay. That's all we have time for today. Don't forget, you can send a letter or an email with your gardening questions. The mailing address is on the screen and the email address is familyplot at wkno.org. I'm Chris Cooper. Thanks for watching and be sure to join us next time for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, is provided by Goodwinds Landscape and Garden Center, in Germantown since 1943, and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants, plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you.